Hey everybody, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com. One of the most challenging aspects of microservices or any distributed application is how you gather and combine data from different services to present it to your client or your UI. I'm going to explain a few different options that you have and the pros and cons of each. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. When we're working within a monolith that has a single database, this isn't really much of an issue. We have our client, this could be a browser just doing server-side rendering, or it could be a spa that's making a call to an HTTP API. At that point though, everything is within a single database. That means that we can make multiple queries, get all the data, compose it together in memory, and then return it back to the client. Now the challenge and the comment I get the most in any of my videos that talk about different services is okay, we're defining these boundaries by capabilities and what a service does, and it has data ownership. But that means that when we provide some type of query, some type of UI, we need to then fetch that data from multiple different services. So that means that if we say have a spa or some client that makes a, an HTTP call to an HTTP API, we need to hit all these different services to get all this data that we then compose on the client to provide our UI. To illustrate this, I'm showing the eShop on container sample application, and I'm kind of making up what these service boundaries could be in an e-commerce type application. So if we look at that screenshot of the homepage, we have all these listings of products. Now let's say the first thing that we have here is we have this brand dropdown and this type dropdown. Now we could assume that we probably have some type of catalog service that has a listing of all the products that we're selling. And that would contain also like the images and the name of all these products. Now separately, we have an entirely different service that's for sales, and it's the one that actually owns the price. So we actually have two different services that have different data that we need to be able to compose this UI. So there's two terms you might've heard before for this composition, and they're not exactly the same thing. I'm gonna cover both. So the first is UI composition, and then there's view model composition. So with UI composition, we could think of our spa application here that's component-based, and we can define components that are owned by a logical boundary. So that means that maybe we have a component for showing the brand, we have a component for showing the type, and these are owned by the catalog service. So basically, as we're building our page, we just drop in these components, um, and we're doing that either at runtime or at build time, depending kind of on the tool set that you're using. And maybe another kind of component that we have built where that's within the catalog service is kind of this grid of different products that we're showing say 12 at a time. But the thing is here is that how do we actually build this where we're, yes, we're gonna have the image, the name, but we then need to get that price. Well, the thing is, is that little price piece there is a component owned by the sales service. So that's how we're doing this composition is that each different component is owned by its respective boundary. And then in our front end, we pick and choose and kind of mix and match and, and compose with different components how we build out our UI. Now this type of UI composition can work really well when you have components that are independent and they don't rely on other components from other boundaries. And that's likely oftentimes because they need to fetch the data themselves. So our brand dropdown and type dropdown for these filters, these components are isolated by themselves. They likely make an HTTP call to our HTTP API to fetch the data to populate that dropdown. Now, if you have a lot of components, this can be pretty chatty. So there's a downside. The other downside is when you have components that need to be composed with uh, other components from other boundaries, like our listing of products. So here, when we have our this price um, component that's likely owned by the sales boundary, every time that's rendered, it needs to go fetch the price for that particular product, that SKU. That means that we could be calling multiple different times depending on how many products we're showing. So really, as we're iterating over this, we kind of have an N plus one problem. So to illustrate this in pseudocode, say the component that's doing all our product listing, it has all the products that it's fetched from the catalog service, it iterates over those. Now it has the image path, it has the name, but then this is where we're using that sales product price component, we're passing the SKU, and then it likely has to do an HTTP call to get the price. And that's where people get into trouble. When you have just a few components on a page, it's really not that big of a deal. However, when you're doing something like listings, et cetera, and you have all these composed components, it can really get out of hand without really even realizing it. So like I said, with that kind of table grid, we go and fetch all the catalog uh, items out that we want to display. And then for each one of them, our components rendering, it has to keep fetching the price. 
So it just keeps the gun going and we're making a lot of HTTP calls. So what often happens when people get in this situation where everything's really slow because you're making all these extra calls is they kind of go the opposite way of starting to do view model composition. And the idea here is that you're gonna have a backend for front end, a BFF, and it's the one doing all the composition. So you have a client that's making a single call to our BFF for a request for a particular PC UI. And it's the one that's going to, for example, fetch all the products from the catalog service. And then once it has all that, once it knows all the products that it needs to uh, get the prices for, it can hit the sales service requesting all the different prices for all of the product IDs or SKUs. And then it can get all that data back. So now we're kind of doing things in batch a little bit, but we're composing everything on our BFF so that we're returning all that data back to the client in a single request. So here's an example of all the data that we're returning in that single request from our spa, from our client, from the BFF. It's returning everything together, the brands, the types, and the listing of all the products. That's all composed together with our name, our price, et cetera. Now it's not that you have to do one or the other, you can do a combination of UI composition and view model composition, depending on what your situation is. But there's one caveat to view model composition that people always run into in that sorting, paging, and filtering kind of listings of data. So as an example, we have our catalog service that owns the name, the image, see the brand ID, the type ID, it has all that information. But what happens if we wanna actually sort this by price? Well, the way we were composing everything is that we were getting all that initial data from the catalog service. And then we were saying, okay, here's all the different SKUs, product IDs. And then we can ask the sales service to give us all the prices for all those particular uh, products. But how are we gonna do this in reverse if we wanna sort by price? This becomes a problem. And this is why you often hear about event carried state transfer or change data capture, which is basically the idea of capturing the changes to particular entities or documents or tables within your system and publishing those as events so other services can consume those events. And what ends up happening here is that you're kind of distributing data around your system. Now this has a lot of pitfalls, but I'll explain what event carried state transfer is. So that means when our catalog service, for example, let's say we change the name of it or something along those lines. We change the name, we change the image location. We're gonna publish, say, a product changed event. And then from there, our sales can pick up that change event. And then what it does is it records that information locally. So you could think of it kind of as a local cache. So now it has all the information from the catalog service about a product and its price. So that means when we think about that original situation, when our client was hitting our BFF, our BFF doesn't need to hit two different services now. It doesn't need to get to the catalog service. It could simply go to the sales service because the sales service has the name, has say the image, as well as the price that it owns. So when we go back to that first problem of, oh, well, how do you, would you sort by price? Well, we can sort by anything or page or filter by anything because sales really has all the data that we need. Now it's important to understand some of the pitfalls. Check out some of the videos that I've done on event carried state transfer and just events in general. But the idea here is that you need to understand that you're dealing with stale data. The data ownership for, for example, the name, the image, et cetera, that belonged to the catalog service. When the catalog service is publishing the events about something changing and the sales service basically recording that as a local cache, it's exactly that. It's a cache. It's potentially stale data. Now you need to be understanding what you're doing with that data. It's one thing to be using it for kind of query purposes. It's another if you're doing some type of business workflow or some type of command or you're doing some type of business logic around that data. Because realize that it could and likely is stale. So the last thing I wanna touch on is doing this composition a little bit more transparent. What I mean by that is when you have a request come in for a particular route, for a particular URI, you can register each service with a gateway saying, yes, I want to handle a portion of this request. So what that means is that the gateway knows, okay, I'm gonna send now a request to the catalog service and to the sales service concurrently, and each of them can be responsible for their portion of composing that view model. And there from there, the gateway doesn't really have to do much, but just merge everything together and return it back to the client. So if you wanna see how something like this works in ASP.NET Core, you can use something like Service Composer. 
And I'll little show you a little sample that it has here is that we have a particular route for slash products of a particular ID, and we have a sales product info, which is owned by the sales boundary, and then we have a marketing product info, which is owned by a completely different boundary. And you can see they're gonna be handling the exact same request, and they're actually gonna be building their portion of the view model out. The sales side here is setting the price, and the marketing service, which I was calling the catalog, is setting, say, the name and the description. UI and view model composition is a big topic. It's not covered enough, but hopefully this video gives you kind of some insights or some thoughts on how you can do UI composition with components that are owned by logical boundaries, or doing view model composition with a back end for front end, or transparently. If you found this topic interesting, or you have these problems, and you'd like to talk to other developers about software architecture and design, make sure to join my channel where you can get access to a private Discord server. Check the links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment, and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.